lucky that you know Nikos, all right? I uh -huh. wish that uh, I knew him tw like 22 years ago when I started back in 1990 because I would have literally saved tens of thousands of dollars and wasted, you know, time and effort. As a matter of fact, back in, <laughs> I think it was 1993, I paid $10,000 to a guy that was sort of the big guru at the time. He was up in Oregon. And basically, after I spent the $10,000 and spent four days with this guy, I realized that what he had taught me was nothing more than a glorified ABC system, which, was a, which wasn't a fraction as good as the one that you're learning right now from Nikos. <laughs> okay, thanks for that. So it definitely, uh, you know, yes, for, so a lot of you, if you're newer traders, you may think, oh, my God, well, what Nikos is teaching me is great. You know, you know it actually works. So you might be thinking, well... If something this simple works, then imagine what I can do if I get even, you know, more systems, more knowledge, and so forth. So, um, you know, you don't need it. Everything, you know, you need to succeed is what you're learning with Nick. John, I'm not sure why it's raspy. I, I just bought a kind of a kind of a higher quality mic, so I'm not sure what's why that would be. But but can everybody uh, hear Jeff anyway? I mean, is it is it clear? I can understand everything he's saying. Okay, if it's too loud, Tom, you can um, lower the volume. That, that is, that's not a problem, I guess. Okay. Okay, Jeff, we had um, we had a question. I know that your your time is limited. And I don't want you to you know um, to take too long. But uh, we have a question. The first question was, what trading style do you prefer? That that is a, the, the first question I see here. Do you want to uh, um, comment on that? Okay, yeah, I just I think I turned the volume down on my mic a little bit so you can tell me if it sounds a little bit better. But it, as far as trading style goes, do you mean like a time frame? Probably, yeah, maybe the, if you are into swing, maybe he uh, means or intraday or... Uh, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Well, for the first uh, probably eight years that I was trading... Really, the only option available was day trading. It's just because back then, you know, there was no currency markets that you could trade back in the the early 90s. There was no mini lots or anything like that. So you needed a really big account. So you didn't have the option of holding positions overnight and so forth. So you had to, like, get into the real scalping and day trading mentality. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, over the last few years, I've switched completely to swing trading and like position trading simply because I think that's where you make the most money and it takes the least time to you know monitor your trade. So it's definitely the only way I'm trading now. Mm -hmm. Higher time frame, so swing trading and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like you know the. Uh, it's like you pointed out, Nick, some of the big brokers in the European firms, they won't even let you look at anything lower than the, uh, the four-hour time frame. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a really good reason for that. Yeah. You know, it just it eliminates a lot of the errors that are made uh, when you start looking at things like the one-hour chart, the 30-minute chart, and so forth, where you start to get a lot more noise. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that noise in the market kind of, it, it's a lot easier to make irrational decisions. Yeah. But these are only the, the real serious brokers. Most of them try to get the spreads and they're always uh, trying to open uh, for people to, to open accounts. So they trade all day long. They, so they make a lot of re uh, return from the spreads. The serious brokers are really only a few. Yeah. All right? Do you agree? No, no, yeah, definitely. And I mean, there's a reason. I mean, the brokers, are, they want, they're in business to make money, so they want the average trader to be day trading like crazy because it's just going to make a lot more money. Mm -hmm. yeah, I agree. Okay, perfect. I th think that answered the question, uh, right? J j yeah, uh, okay. Jay, I still use the inside bar system today. I mean, that's kind of, that's something I actually started trading back in 19, uh, 1998 in the stock market. And it's just a pattern that just keeps working, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, George, my trading style, you know, I've learned probably hundreds of systems over the years, but it's 
what I've come to learn is that simple really is the best. So even though I might do things a little bit different than Nikos, they're really they're really doing the same thing, okay? Because at the end of the day, I'm still trading ABC system. It's just you know I have a little bit of different way to read the market, but one isn't better than the other. It's kind of what you're comfortable with. Yeah, exactly. I agree. Yeah, uh, Jan. Just just in a nutshell, the the inside bar system that I had created was that. You know, I like to look at what's called the inside bar. It's just a small bar that the kind of the length of that bar is smaller than the bar to the left of it. And basically what the inside bar represents is when you're getting consolidation in the market. And so basically the more consolidation you have, the higher probability is that there's going to be an explosive move out of that inside bar. So basically what I like to do is look for the inside bar when it sets up in certain key areas. In other words, let's say the market is pulling back to a prominent support resistance level. Maybe you get that inside bar at a kind of a big round number, like let's say 1.3000 on the euro. Uh, let's say it's at a previous, um, like a, a big Fibonacci retracement level. So anytime you see those inside bars set up at a major technical pattern, it could be if it's at the 200 moving average, uh, it could be if it's at a double top, double bottom. But anyway, I like to look for those inside bars when they're coinciding with multiple technical formations, and then you have a pretty good shot at getting a good trade. Can I interrupt for a second? Yeah. Uh, Jeff, maybe at some point, if I don't know if, if the people would like it, can maybe uh, um, meet another time and you can uh, give us some examples, like maybe two, three charts ready and a um, little bit more visually. Yeah, and, and yeah definitely. That, I, that, I can prepare some stuff that way. If okay, great. That, that I think people. Yeah, Nick, I'd be happy to do that. Okay, that's perfect. perfect. Yeah, it would definitely make more sense when I kind of. Yeah. Yeah, Nick, it would make more sense when I kind of show it in the big picture. Yes, perfect. Thanks. Uh, yeah, Mark, you had asked a question about like uh, pin bars, outside bars. Uh, I like lots of different bars. It's not just uh, the inside bars. It could be like the uh, narrow range bar. Like some people like to look at like the they look at the what was the most narrow range bar say the last four or five days. That's a great way to look for consolidation. I like to look at some of the uh, Japanese candlesticks like the engulfing patterns, like the bullish and bearish engulfing pattern, uh, the doji bars, the cross doji bars. Um, and also the the hammer bar, and also the kind of the mirror image, which is the inverted hammer. Mm -hmm. it, basically, to as far as the bars go, there's not one bar. I think it's just kind of like you want to you want to learn as many of them as you can, and then over time you just get to recognize them, and then you can kind of you know it just adds to your knowledge base. Yes, I agree. Okay. Uh, okay, George. Uh, you had mentioned, uh, you know, what was my biggest fear when I started trading? And uh, well, <laughs> this was keep in mind. This was back in 1990, long before there was an internet. And back then, uh, there was no forex market like we have today. The only way you could participate in trading the currencies was through the uh, the currency futures markets. And uh, you know, back then, it was like one tick or one smallest price of pi uh, price movement was twelve dollars and fifty cents. <laughs> so anyway, uh, back then, what you had to do was you couldn't just go on the internet and place your trade anonymously. You had to actually call, like, pick up the telephone, dial your broker, and tell them. You know, you'd have to say, like, okay, I want to buy, you know, one contract of the uh, Japanese yen. And what? The, so keep in mind that uh, it was a lot of money for me to risk back then. You didn't have mini lots or micro lots to practice with. So anyway, uh, 
one of the biggest fears was I, I was so afraid to make the wrong decision, and then I was afraid to lose money. But what was really freaking me out was that I'd sit there really stressing out whether I was making the right decision as far as my analysis goes. And so by the time I would identify a trade, I knew that I would have to pick up the telephone to call my broker. And what was kind of, I can laugh about it now, was that the minute I'd start to pick up the phone, my hand would start shaking, okay? I oh, could man. barely speak the order into the phone because I was so afraid to commit that order because it wasn't, you know, it was a good process back then. It was, it was costly to put your trades in. I remember that. And, you know, Even I remember. the broker would take your order, he'd repeat it back to you, then he'd have to call down to the floor, and then they'd have to confirm the trade. So it wasn't like, you know, you could click the button to get out if you felt nervous or unsure. So <laughs> there was a big, big fear process of just, you know, committing to that trade. And actually, I also started trading the... S&P futures markets, which were five times more costly back then, the minimum uh, uh, price movement was $50. Okay, so you were any given trade risking about $500. So it was so bad as far as my fear of picking up the phone that I got to the point where I literally could no longer pick up the phone. I was so scared. And so I had to get my wife to team up with me I would do the analysis and she would pick up the phone and call in the order and it's the only way I could get around, you know, oh, wow. that kind of pressure, but it was just so stressful. I mean, you back then you could lose $500 in a heartbeat. Yeah, that's true. You see, we have a big advantage uh, now. Yeah, honey, it, it was huge, huge leverage. It was, um, I think, I can't remember the equivalents, but I would believe it was... It would be like the equivalent of the minimum order of like trading five standard lots now. Mm. There we go. And, uh, you know, and back then, too, it wasn't like you could open up an account with $2,000. I, I think I had to have like $20,000 in the account, and that was simply because the leverage was so big back then. Uh George, you, you had asked what the advantages to trading currency futures are. Uh, in my opinion, I think that the currency futures are a little bit more transparent and regulated. In other words, you, you trade them on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, and it's so it's very transparent. Whereas a lot of these forex brokers, you don't know where they're going to where they're located. They can be offshore. Each broker kind of has their own. Uh, way they process orders, and you never really know what's going on, so you never know if you're getting an accurate fill. Uh, you never really know if the market's trading or they say it's trading. So every broker is going to be different, whereas the currency futures, it's it's very consistent. Uh, yeah, Robert, you're right. It doesn't matter. Uh, what system you use, what market you trade, it, it's everything. The trade management, it's just money management is kind of what you live and die with in this business. And uh, I just wanted to share a quick story about a guy, he's a good friend of mine, and he lost over the last uh, kind of 10 years like a million dollars trading. And the thing about it is that it wasn't like he was some multi-multi-millionaire where he could afford to trade, you know, and if he lost a million dollars, it wouldn't be a big deal. Basically, he was a guy that worked hard, he made a really good living, and over the course of uh, like 12 years, he saved up about a million dollars in his retirement account. And so he kind of got tired of only making 5% a year in his tax-free bonds. So when he started to get into trading, he figured, well, now he's going to double his money every year. So what ended up happening over the course of about 10 years of trading, he kept uh, losing more and more and more money. Classic. And at the end of the day, the only thing that caused him to make money was, or actually what caused him to lose all his money, he simply used no money management. He was always winging it every trade. He was risking different amounts of money. I can remember times, this was back in the, uh, 
when the whole before the stock market crashed in 2001. He, this guy, he would go say, oh, I just bought $300,000 of Qualcomm stock or something like that. He was taking these massive positions, so he was betting 30, 40% of his account at times on uh, one, one stock, and he would have no stop losses in place. Oh, man. Yeah, it was crazy. So the, so the thing about it is that we look back at all his trades and... Uh, I told him that if he had simply used a stop loss, he would at least broken even versus losing the million dollars. Yeah, exactly. We have some some uh, um, funny uh, comments here. No, I I didn't have a million to lose. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't have yeah, a million yeah, to lose, yeah. so no, I didn't lose that much. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Hey, you know, this is the interesting thing about it, and this is where like greed really comes into trading. It's 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 really dangerous. Uh, my friend Joe that I've been talking about, he had a, uh, a Ferrari, and that was kind of his pride and joy. And when the newer Ferrari came out, he thought, "Oh, I'm just, I'm going to sell my Ferrari. I'm going to go uh, place a couple trades. I'm going to make all my money back, like 100% return, and then I'm going to go buy the new Ferrari." Well, he ended up blowing all that money he sold his Ferrari for in about a month. So now today he's got no Ferrari. Oh man! You know, he, 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 you know he can't even remote. He can't even you know trouble buying an average car now. So you know, but once again, it all comes back to greed. He just got really greedy, and he made the kind of the cardinal mistake, which is to focus more on what he was going to make versus what what the potential to lose was. Yes. Okay, uh Hutch had mentioned that do I take uh enter textbook trades thirty to sixty minutes after uh yeah, I, I think thirty to sixty minutes is more than enough. Usually uh I don't want to be in you know, I'll I'll close positions out like fifteen minutes before the news. And I think uh, after 30 minutes, the market's going to process it whatever way it's going to do. So I think uh, as long as, uh, let's say that you have a, a particular price point you want to get in at, as long as uh, the news didn't blow way past your entry, then you could still look to get in. Okay, let's see. Uh, George, I'm just reading your question. Yeah, I think it. Uh, I think it cha it changes people. Uh, one of my mentors, he told me, he said, Jeff, he said, uh, you you quickly learn within minutes everything there is to know about yourself when you start trading. Yeah, and you know true. it's definitely true. You start to understand, you know where where your weaknesses are, uh, whether you have problems with uh, emotions, fear, greed, discipline, and so forth. And so it's like the minute you start trading, it's like kind of a you know a mirror. And uh, so if what's staring back is not good, it, it's you know the trading is is trying to tell us something. So you definitely learn a lot from it, and. Uh, I think over time, as you start to learn what mistakes are happening, it does make you a better person. Uh, and you know, ultimately, once you do get it in control, then it does uh, give you an opportunity to make some a nice living off of this. That's true. Uh, Mark, you had mentioned about the reversal levels. It's it's not an exact science. It's really based over you know my twenty plus years, but. Really, in a nutshell, I'm looking at a lot of uh, previous uh, key support and resistance levels. I'm looking at where any like really big round numbers, like something major, like 1.400. Uh, the market loves the big round numbers. I look at uh, past uh, congestion areas. I'll look at past uh, major Fibonacci levels on the daily charts. And then basically what I like to do is if I see like a lot of those technical points uh, clustering together, 
that's where I'll mark down one of my uh, support resistance levels for the upcoming week. Okay, did, did you read the? Nick, did you have some questions you wanted to ask, or something, some things you wanted to chat about? There's just a question I see from Jan about your doctor. Uh, it says, "Are you your doctor?" Oh, okay. 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 okay well, back in kind of in my a former part of my life, before I got into trading, I was uh, a chiropractor, and uh, I was doing that up till uh, 1990. And it was that kind of 1990, I got this 38-page uh, pamphlet in the mail telling me that I could make a fortune trading commodities, you know, things like soybeans, coffee, and so forth. And I thought, wow, that sounds a lot better than having to go to an office six days a week and be there from 7 in the morning to 7 at night. <laughs> and it just, you know, so that's when I got hooked into trading. And as I started to get more and more involved in trading, I, I got out of uh started to phase out of my practice as a chiropractor. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, I have... If, if, yeah, if but you know, one thing I... Sorry, we have a delay. So uh, yeah, just one other thing I just want... Oh, sorry. Uh, just one thing I wanted to point out was that... Uh, I made the crucial mistake in the beginning is that I, I was making a nice living as a chiropractor and I got lured into the easy money of uh, trading. And, you know, and as, uh, what I quickly found out is that it wasn't easy money. And one of my other mentors, he said, Jeff, it's, it's, trading is the, the hardest, easiest money you'll ever make. And, you know, it really is. On the surface, it seems so easy. You know, you say, you know, you can look at a chart and say, oh, if I bought here and I see the market, if I just sold out here, you know, you start calculating all the money and so forth, <laughs> and it just seems so easy in hindsight. But the, you know, the reality is so different when you're you're putting your hard-earned money on the line and you don't have the the benefit of you know 2020 hindsight. You know, so I, I one thing I just wanted to talk about really quickly is I think that when anybody gets into trading, you know, I think that people initially get into it because they heard about the easy money that they can make. It's almost like sort of like a business opportunity that they can get into with low startup cost. Yes. And so I think you always have to question why you're doing it. I mean, you really have to love it because um, it's not easy and it, it can turn out to be nothing more than a very expensive hobby. So uh, you really have to do it for the right reasons. Hey, Dave, um, a couple of reasons. You know, it makes you a better trader. When you start to teach people uh, what you know, it really reinforces what you know and what you think you know, and it also keeps you on your toes. All right, like you have to kind of be accountable, and you've you got to always try to be learning more and more so that you can give good advice to people. Uh, another thing is, I just started like 12 weeks ago taking tango, and this was something that looks very easy on the surface, but it's actually very hard. And my teacher very early on, they said, if you want to get good at tango, once you know one step, Become a teacher and teach the person that one step you know. And they said, if that person's new, you'll be teaching them something new. And they said, when you learn two steps, teach them the new step. Oh, cool, Marianne. So, uh, so anyway, I urge everybody, like, you know, you don't have to teach people, you know, for a living or anything like that. But teach your spouse, your significant other, you know, uh, maybe your son or daughter. Teach them what you're doing because... It's going to really uh, make you much more focused on what you know. You'll also learn where your weaknesses are as well. I agree 100%. The same opinion on that one. On almost everything you said, actually. Okay, are there other questions? Yeah. There you go.
big up, Tom. Good. <laughs> it really does help. Yes. Uh, actually, once I just wanted to ask everybody a question. Is there anybody in here that's still paper trading? Yes, there are. I'll tell them to to do so. Uh, <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, how how long? For those of you who've been paper trading, how long have you been paper trading for? Uh, okay, that's cool. The only reason I, I ask that is that like. Uh, because I've been teaching people since 2003, I've, I've literally run into uh, people that have been, you know, paper trading for like three, four years, and it, you know, it's kind of like what I had learned is, you know, some people are so fearful of uh, that they don't know enough, or they're so scared that they're going to lose money that they can never really uh, kind of get over that fear of pulling the trigger and jumping in, and uh, one lesson that's really vivid for me is I I used to have a one of my students he had bought uh, one of my programs like back in probably uh, 2006 and his name was Saeed and he was from Dallas and he was a really nice guy and every couple of weeks I would I would get this call and it just he say he'd call me and say hey Jeff it's Saeed from Dallas I'm just you know wanted to say hi and see how you're doing and so. He had called me, you know, like this for four years, and we always had the same conversation. He had never actually jumped in and took a real money trade. And, you know, once again, it was because of the fear he was having and the uncertainty. He just couldn't get over that kind of uh, that hurdle. And so uh, one day I, I got an email, and I heard that Saeed passed away. And so it really got me bummed out because, you know, all these years he was just dreaming about – trading and making some nice money from it so there he was he kept putting it off putting it off and he just never got an opportunity to do that so I you know I always think of that guy when oh, wow. you know I'm talking to people and they're having pull, trouble you know getting into trades you know so you know as they say life is kind of short so you, at some point you just have to commit and you know jump in yes that's that's true man it's really a good example Yeah, I mean, you know, and one thing too, I think the the best things I've learned are, um, you know, from some uh, unfortunate circumstances that other people haven't been involved in. You know, and so it's it's always, you know, a lot of advice I may be giving you, or you might have heard before, but uh, you know, you want to make sure that you're applying it, even though it just sounds kind of simple, you know, like simple practical advice. Because it's really the simple stuff that's going to make you a good trader. It's not some fancy indicator or system. Okay, great. Um, can, can you hear me, Jeff? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, I have uh, some questions here for you still. If you have the strength still, or if it's okay with you. Yeah. <laughs> Um, some questions. Yeah, I, I, wanted to say, I just, I just want to, I just want to. I sorry, I just want to answer Mark's question. Yeah, yeah, uh, Mark. Yeah, I, I had wish micro uh, lots were available. It would have been a great way to trade. Uh, it's just, it's such a good way to do it. At least when you have micro lots, you have some skin in the game, and it, it can, even though it's only like you know ten cents a, uh, a pip, it still gets you. You know, it can, you know, you break a little bit of a sweat because now you're, you know, you're your opinion and everything is on the line. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we have a little bit of delay. Uh, sorry, I Jack, I didn't mean to cut you off there. Oh, no, you don't. Oh, you're oh not, yeah. You're not cu cutting off. It's just we have like two, three seconds delay and it's always a little bit. That's why, why, why I'm waiting. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you had mentioned you had some questions. Yeah, I have some questions people send over. Um, one would be yes about the ego here Marianne uh, already said that dealing oh. with the ego what do you have to say about that oh okay um, 
the first thing is the ego is like, you know, one of the hardest things to deal with. And, you know, I think most people that get into, trade are, into trading are very intelligent. You know, so we, you know, we're, a lot of us are quite analytical. And we like to think that if we're smart enough and if we do enough homework and enough analysis that uh, we're going to make the right choices. So it's really hard to accept that uh, when we get into a trade that when it doesn't work out that they were wrong. So that really, you know, that boils down to our ego. We just hate to admit that we made, you know, the, the wrong choice. But, you know, the bottom line is it doesn't matter uh, – you know, how educated you are, uh, you know, how advanced the university education you got. The, the market doesn't give a crap about it, you know, uh, excuse the language, but it just does not care who we are, you know, or what our opinions are. The market's always uh, has the final decision. So I think for that reason, we just kind of have to, you know, try to get humble and realize that if we're wrong, we're wrong. And that's why it's so important to use the money management that Nikos is teaching where, you know, he just knows that you put the stop in at a certain place and, you know, if you're wrong, you're wrong and you just move on. And that way the ego really gets out of it. Yeah. Also, I wanted to point out my friend Joe, I had mentioned that lost a million dollars. His One of his big problems was it was ego. He just could not accept a loser, so... He would sit there and let a you know a small loss let it keep growing, 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 and you know before long he's out one hundred fifty, two hundred thousand dollars in a trade. You're right, Marianne. You just got to surrender. You have to know, uh, you know, when to cut your losses. Yeah, yeah, Kanesh. It's all about managing risk. I mean, you you know it's. Uh, you can truly have a, just an average system, and if you manage your risk properly, you're still going to make some money. I've seen people, uh, you know, to give you an example, like as some of you know, I, I, I have my own trading systems that I teach, and I've had, you know, situations where one person will make a lot of money, like a six-figure income in a year, and another person will tell me it's crap, or and then I'll have, like, uh, people in all, you know, for making, you know, a couple hundred dollars to a few thousand dollars, but it it's really boils down to how they manage the system that they're using. Yeah, Mark, that, that's it. You got to follow the rules. And I, and I was actually just wanted to add something to that. I was talking to... Uh, uh, Robert on a call uh, with Nikos, and I had mentioned that, you know, a good way to ensure that you follow the rules is just to kind of play a little game with yourself in that, like, pretend that you just got hired by a big financial firm in London, and they told you that you're going to make 200,000 pounds salary a year, and they say that all you have to do is follow the rules that are written on one piece of paper, you know. If the trade sets up, you buy and you sell here. That's all you have to do. And as long as you follow the rules, you're going to get that nice fat paycheck. So, you know, now the problem is that when we're trading at home, we have, uh, you know, we can do anything we want with trades and we can change our minds, you know, and, you know in a heartbeat. So that's where kind of uh, sometimes people start to uh, sabotage your rules. So just look at more of a job, you know, a company that you have no choice but to follow your rules. That's a good one. A very good example. Okay, uh, Dave, I'm just reading your question there. Dave, that, you know, that's a good question. I think it, it really depends on the individual. I mean, I've, you know, keep in mind just for myself, um, it took me about five years to start making money on a regular basis. I mean, I had like kind of uh, sort of fl flashes of brilliance that would quickly disappear, you know, before that five years. I wasn't consistent. And then uh, I've worked with traders, some of them that haven't been profitable for their first, like, six years, and then they start working with me, and, you know, they start to, 
they start to actually get a break-even week, which may not seem like a big deal, but it was a big deal, and then they start slowly going up. So, uh, you know, as long as you have the enthusiasm and the motivation, and, uh, you know, it's not a situation where maybe you're risking your rent money or the ability to feed your family, then, you know, uh, it's never too late to turn it around. You know, especially if you're following what Nikos does. I, you know, I honestly believe if you guys just do what he says religiously, it'll work out. Jeff, uh, just a question in between, uh, now that we have a little bit of silence. <laughs> um, there's a question about oh, okay. <laughs> your, your favorite market. Do you have any favorite uh, markets or did we already answer it? I don't, I don't think so. Uh, do you uh, have any favorite? No, I didn't. I mean, you know, it's, yeah, actually I don't, okay? It's, uh, Whatever money I can make, uh, or whatever market I can make money, and I'm happy, you know. And it's just uh, a lot of times I'll choose a market simply because it fits uh, what I'm into at the time, or my lifestyle, or how much time. Like for instance, now uh, I'm doing a lot of stock trading simply because stocks are something I can relate to. You know, you can research about the companies, and you can still do all your technical analysis. And at the same time, because I don't want to spend a lot of time glued to the computer, you know, I can put on my trades and, uh, you know, a lot of my positions I only look at once a week. I've had some trades on since 2007, but, you know, uh, it's great. I never think about them at night and I've just got, kind of got this long-term plan. So uh, I love stocks. I love the, the versatility in the Forex market. You know, I like that you can trade you know, 24-7, you know, the only thing I don't like about that is there's the temptation to always feel like you're missing something, you know, <laughs> you're worried about what's happening in the middle of the night, <laughs> you know, so I had to wean myself away from that, the easiest way to do that is to only look at the four hour or uh, higher time frame so that you, you don't feel like you always have to be looking at things. Uh, another market I like is stock options. It's just kind of, you know, you get a lot of leverage and you know your risk, you know, you yes. can kind of really limit your downside. Uh, I also like the uh, the mini futures contracts, like the S&P 500 and the Dow. That's a lot of fun, too. That's something that I really, you know, kind of grew up on, so it's kind of uh, mm -hmm. one of my favorites. Are you trading metals? Do you and like then um, also... also I, I've dabbled it just a little bit way back in the uh, when I was learning the commodity trade back in the 1990s, but I haven't done anything with them in a while, a long time actually. Okay. Uh, one other thing that I'm looking into is something that I ha hadn't heard about from until about a couple weeks ago. They're called 1086, and it's these companies that. Uh, they basically, it's kind of, you can buy them like a stock, and these companies sort of, it's the infrastructure of oil, like in the U.S., so in other words, it's not, you're not really speculating on oil, but it's the infrastructure, like the pipelines and stuff like that, mm -hmm. and uh, these companies typically pay, uh, I think, at least 5 to 12 percent uh, dividend a year, wow. so it's kind of like a very low low risk play it's something great for like a retirement fund you can put them in your retirement accounts and they've been pl paying some of them have been i think if you compounded it but averaging near 30 percent a year for the last 12 years so it's something that i'm looking into because i just buy it and just keep it in my uh retirement account is it guaranteed or is it uh what you're talking right now the profits? Well, well, it's. I know that these companies have like a. They've never defaulted on their rates. A lot of them have keep slowly inching up, so they they're just like clockwork. And part of the reason is that there's this big loophole that was made uh, back in the 1980s when Ronald Reagan was president. And one of the stipulations for these uh, oil companies was that they had to di redistribute 90% of their profits back to the shareholders so that these companies could get these huge tax benefits. So for that reason, they hmm. keep paying, uh, you know, every quarter, like clockwork, these dividends. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, 
Okay. Jay had mentioned the, how critical is New York market close on the candle charts. Uh, I'm not quite sure what you mean. It, would that be like that there can be differences if you're looking at, like, say, you know, if you're looking at a candle close in, say, London or something? Oh, uh, okay, Jay, I got you. Um, I don't really think it matters, especially you know, in the big scheme of things. If you're uh, if you're swing trading and position trading, you know, yes, they're going to be a little bit different, but you just have to decide, you know, which one is kind of your master that you're looking at. In other words, maybe it's the daily uh, the daily close you're looking at is kind of your your bigger time frame. But then if you're going to enter in on your four hour, then I would put more energy into that as far as where that closes. Okay, great. Uh, Jeff, I have uh, another interesting, probably uh, two other questions and then I'll really, um, we leave you alone. Yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> um, oh, no, no, wor no worries. I, I'm happy to help. <laughs> okay, perfect. Um, the, I have one here that says, what was the biggest mistake you ever made when trading and what was your biggest success? So like the worst and the best part. Could you, could you? Uh, oh, okay, well, okay, what, what, one of my biggest successes and mistakes all rolled in one was uh, back in 19, I think it was 98, I had become aware of a company called uh, GTMI. I think it was, it was a Philippine uh, telecommunications company, and at the time, the shares were selling at like 12 cents. So I, I think I bought, I can't remember, 100,000, 150,000 shares, so it wasn't really a lot of money. So anyway... Over the next couple of years, as the stock market, you know, was going into that bubble phase, the stock was up at like three dollars and fifty cents. So I had, I go into my um, my brokerage account, and I had like it would. Well, keep in mind, I had only invested like I don't know fifteen thousand dollars or something. So I would start going in my brokerage account and see that now I'm I have over two hundred thousand dollars in there. There we go. And so this was by far, this was by far, it just blew me away. I would have days where <laughs> I would be up $10,000 because the market, you know, you don't need a lot of, a lot of movement when you've got that many shares to make a lot of money. And I was just so, I could not believe this was happening. But now here's, so that was my biggest uh, success to the point. And so, but because the stock market hadn't collapsed yet, I started talking myself into things. I reasoned that, okay, well, this is a new tele uh, telecommunications company. It's only at 350 and I'd say, well, look at this uh, company. They're valued $100. And I'd start saying, surely I can get to a, you know, a meager $10 or 20 <laughs> So I got so focused on what I was going to make. My greed glands would just, oh, you know, I was going to buy a private island. I had it all the figured out. <laughs> and... Yeah, yeah, it's exactly it. So, and I didn't have a stop in place because I thought, wow, okay, nobody can touch me, right? I'm just so far in the money, it's ridiculous. Well, <laughs> the, the stock market, the bubble started to burst, and the stock started to roll over, and then it started to come down there $3, and I think, oh, you know, it's still going to go to 20 I got so much breathing room, don't worry about it. Well, I became so... Uh, paralyzed that the fact that eventually it was starting to get 250 and I said, no, nah, don't worry. This, this, Because, of course, at the time, you didn't know it was a bubble, right? You thought everything was going to start resuming. I said, oh, okay, now it's a 50% retracement. No worries. It's going to resume. So to make a long story short, I ended up basically letting that stock dwindle down to nothing. So I, I wrote a you know, twelve or fifteen thousand dollar investment, to a quarter million dollars almost, and let it go back to zero. So well, that, to me, was just—I was total ass. I mean, it, 
to, total total criminal, stupidest thing ever to do. So um, I can't say it enough. Don't fall in love with whatever you're trading, and I don't care if it's a stock or a currency. Yeah, that that, that, that was a good one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I mean, it's just don't fall in love with anything, you know, don't be married to your position, and it yeah. it comes back into what Marianne was talking about, it's like ego, you know, I didn't want to be wrong, I thought I had the whole, uh, I did my homework on the that, that sector, and I thought there was so much upside. Yeah, I know. What you know, so, so now though, uh, you know, one of my... One of my uh, the biggest trades that I'm in currently, I've been in it for uh, like five years now almost, is that I've been in a company called Cirrus, Cirrus Radio, and I've been collecting shares since it's at uh, like 50 cents, and now I think, well, yesterday it closed at 308, so I've got a lot of shares in that, but I'm up a lot of money, but at least now I have more of a plan you know, an escape plan, stuff like that, so I don't make the same mistake I did again. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's all about, you know, learning from the mistakes, like always. Yeah, yeah you know, it's really painful. And, you know, the thing about it is, you have to, the problem with trading is that when, you're, when your money is in your account uh, and you haven't cash closed out the position, it's just, it's like play money. It doesn't mean anything. So you have to start thinking about what does that open profit mean? And for me, I look back, I had ever since I was a kid in school, I wanted a Lamborghini. And to think now that I could have paid cash for that Lamborghini if I had closed out that trade, but I never really thought about what that money was. It wasn't play money. It could have bought a house. It could have bought the car or whatever. Um, yes. so you really have to think about when you do have a big winning and trade on hand, uh, what what that uh, could do for you. And yeah, that's why it's so important that you take incremental. And just one other quick. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, no, you're right, Nick, and I was going to say that it is important, too, that you've got to take the profits, and also, though, uh, a mistake that a lot of people make, and I, I used to make this a lot, is that uh, the minute I get in a trade, I'm up, like, you know, $50, $100, and I'm getting all excited, and I am thinking about what that $50, $100 means, and then I'd say, ooh, maybe I better hold on, that's decent money, I could, you know, do something fun with it, and so that thought would keep me from you know applying proper money management was which was just to let the trade breathe properly okay great there's a question from Robert do you see that uh, oh let's see any persistent bad habits now um, I think, Robert, it would be that I always have to uh, rein myself in. In other words, it's always it's always uh, tempting. In other words, you know, let's say you're trading the currencies. Well, you're wondering, well, what stock market trades am I missing? And then you're thinking, oh, you know, like, uh, what am I missing in some other field and so forth? So for me, it's always having to... Uh, keep uh, refocusing myself and not be tempted you know it's the, the problem with trading is it's easy to get you know uh, distracted by all kinds of uh, bright shiny objects you know whether it's more markets or other trading systems other strategies other people's opinions so for me it's just that I always have to keep pulling myself back uh, doing things one way and make sure that I don't start changing the rules and start playing around with lots of other time frames and so forth. Yeah, very important. Okay, great. Um, hey, Jeff, that was really something. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can. And, and Nick, what we'll do next time is have everyone, you know, any other questions? Because, you know, sometimes when you start talking, it kind of like people will think of things they forgot to ask. So, I'm, you know, I'm happy next time to answer them. Uh, also, 
you know, I'm happy to show some charts on things, just kind of teach some little tips. Um, you know. Okay, we can organize something, uh, maybe. And, and, you know, that, yeah. Okay. Um, are you going to talk? Yeah, Nick. Yeah, yeah. Well, just you know, whatever you want to do. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm getting a little bit of a, a delay and echo here. Yeah. 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 Hey, John. Yeah. One, one thing I want to say is like, really, there's no. I think in some ways there's there's no, you know, big secrets in trading. You know, it's just kind of a. It's more like sometimes what makes one system work a little bit better. It's just kind of little incremental changes. And you know, if you think about it, like uh, let's say you wanted to learn to play golf. Well, you could go uh, learn to play golf at your local country club, and then you kind of hire a uh, one of the the professionals there. Well, you could do that. Or let's say then you went and took uh, golf lessons from Tiger Woods. Tiger Woods is still going to be teaching you with the same amount of clubs. And he's not going to teach you anything that's that much different. It might be these small incremental changes that make all the difference. And so I think that's really what sort of the secrets in trading are, just small little ways to uh, look at the market. And that's really what Nick is so good at. He just, you know, he's looking at things that a lot of other people have been staring at, but he's just kind of pieced them together in a really great structure. Yeah, yeah, Jen. Yeah, the biggest secret is there is no secret. You know, it's just it's just applying stuff. And a lot of times, though, it's like it takes people. Sometimes you got to spend years and years looking at charts to kind of know, you know, what's good, what's bad. And sometimes, you know, you get off on these long tangents looking for really, uh, you know, fancy stuff, and then you come back to the realization that you know some basic patterns were the way to go. You know, so that that in itself is kind of discovering to me the the holy grail or the secret. Oh, great! Okay, great, uh, Jeff. Thank you very much. I mean, uh, please, everybody, um, a big thank you to Jeff for answering the questions. I think it's a lot of a lot of little things and very important things you you learn here just today from Jeff, right? <laughs>